you've probably noticed, everything is getting more expensive. Inflation is on a tear. The US Central Bank is battling to tamp down on raging inflation. Inflation sticker shock is hitting millions of Americans hard. Bloating price tags and reaching the highest rates since the great inflation of the 1970s. We must maintain budget restraint and fiscal responsibility. The causes of inflation are complicated, numerous, and widely debated ranging from war and disrupted supply chains to high wages and high demand and too many dollars chasing too few goods. The solutions to inflation are widely debated, not always obviously effective, and sometimes downright experimental. While governments are often blamed for high inflation and they pay the price for it at the polls, the unenviable task of actually cracking down on high inflation falls to a country's core financial institution, the central bank. But with no sign of slowing down, their ability to do that, to crack down on inflation, it's under scrutiny. And it begs the question, how much control do central banks really have over inflation? Can they be relied on to make life more affordable again? And what, if anything, can be done this time around to tame rising prices? If, like me, you're not an economist, then this whole story can be kind of hard to grasp, right? There's just so many tricky terms and interwoven moving parts that actually understanding inflation and central banks and monetary policy, it just sounds like a headache waiting to happen. But I think if we break it down bit by bit and with some expert guidance, we can get there. So I called up political economist Mark Blythe to help walk me through it. All right, I'm recording now. Excellent. He's written and talked a lot about this subject, and he's actually writing a book right now about inflation. Called Inflation, a Guide for Users and Losers. In our conversation, Mark talked about stories of inflation. He emphasized the numerous unique causes and the many different experiences people have of inflation. I think all inflations are kind of like time period dependent and are due to special factors, right? I don't know what a true story of inflation is. As we'll see, one takeaway from my talk with Mark is that making sense of the economy is to make sense of many stories unique to their time. And a story has many different interpretations. And the story of central banks and inflation is no exception. We'll come back to Mark to help make sense of things as we go along. But first, let's introduce the main character of this story, the central bank. Virtually every country in the world has a central bank. In the US, it's the Federal Reserve. And central banks aren't like regular commercial banks. They have special roles and responsibilities. Their main goal is to maintain steady and sustainable economic growth and price stability. It's a fine balance, and they achieve it through a set of actions known as monetary policy. This is not to be confused with fiscal policy, which is actions taken by the government, like changing taxes or spending packages, Many of those actions are aimed at keeping inflation low and stable. Currently, many central banks share a target of 2% inflation. But how do they do that? And how effective are they? That's the key question. And to answer that, we need to dig deeper into the causes of inflation. The underlying story is you've got too much money chasing too few goods. And if that's the case, isn't it handy that you have a central bank because they're the people that print the money? So the simple story would be reduce the amount of money you're spending, which we tried in the 1980s called targeting the money supply. So that's one of the tools that the central bank has at its disposal. They can control the money supply. In theory, more money in circulation means more spending and more inflation. Less money, the opposite, less inflation. And we'll get back to how well changing the money supply works in controlling inflation later on in the video. And the other way you do this is you target interest rates, right? Interest rates are the central bank's primary tool for fighting inflation. Rate hikes are highly anticipated among people who pay attention to that kind of thing. Once in a while, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, currently this guy, Jerome Powell, gets up in front of a podium and makes an announcement like this. Today, the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point. And it causes a frenzy in the news. Breaking news, everyone will be watching and waiting. But why? 
what's the big deal about three quarters of a percentage point? And how is this supposed to reduce inflation? Well, you can think of interest rates as like the price of money, more specifically the price of borrowing money. Central banks change interest rates to influence people's spending behavior, whether they spend or save. More spending means more inflation. Less spending, the opposite. Higher interest rates discourage spending by making borrowing more expensive, so it raises the price of money. At the same time, higher interest rates make saving more rewarding and attractive. So people stop spending as much, demand drops, the economy cools down, and with time, prices begin to stabilize and even fall. You bring uh, kind of the economy to a screeching halt as the cost of borrowing goes up, and that shrinks the economy and gets rid of the inflation. So in that world, central banks are super important, right? Right. But of course, in the real world, it's not quite so simple. Whether central banks are really in control of inflation, it depends whether you're talking about the causes or the effects of inflation. Economists talk about three types of inflation. You have inflation caused by surging demand, inflation caused by a diminishing supply, and inflation caused by people's expectations. To get a better sense of what central banks can do about inflation, let's look at the worst period of inflation in American history, the 1970s. By most measures, the 1970s were a very bad decade for the economy, in America especially. The stock market was tanking. Growth was stagnant. At one point, unemployment reached double digits. And prices were so out of control that the period was dubbed the Great Inflation. The causes of inflation were numerous and complicated, and still debated. On the supply side, failed harvests in the early 70s caused a massive global spike in food prices. The Americans have been fighting the Vietnam War pretty much without raising taxes off the books and super overheating the economy. Loose monetary policy meant a vast expansion of the money supply. And remember, more money, more spending, more inflation. You then have two big oil shocks because of the 1973 war and then because of the 1979 Iranian revolution. Iranian militants seized the American embassy. In that meant energy prices went through the roof as well. So a combination of supply shortages and loose monetary policy were pushing up prices across the board. By the end of the decade, things were looking very bleak. And for almost everybody, soaring prices were top of mind. But one man is widely credited with turning things around. A towering six foot four cigar smoking economist named Paul Volcker. President Carter appointed Volcker chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1979, and he made some radical and controversial moves that are still widely discussed today. As Fed chair, Volcker reached for the central bank's best weapon against inflation, interest rates. He allowed them to reach a peak of 20%, higher than ever before or since. He essentially doused the economy in a giant bucket of cold water threw it in the freezer. Jacking up interest rates this much can send the economy straight into a recession. And that was actually the plan. Volcker and others like him thought that a recession, painful as they are, was necessary to cool down such an overheating economy. And in the early 1980s, Volcker got what he bargained for. With higher interest rates, borrowing money became really expensive and saving was much more attractive. People stopped spending, and the movement of money around the economy slowed down to a halt, slipping into recession twice in just a few years. People weren't happy. Unemployment reached the highest level since the Great Depression. But in the end, it worked. Inflation was squashed. And by the end of the 1980s, and only up until recently, inflation had been tamed. This story would suggest that Volcker's massive interest rate hikes saved the day, and that central banks do control inflation. But remember, there's many ways to interpret a story in economics. And as Mark reminded me, 
The inflation of the 70s isn't the same as the inflation of today. Do you think there's any lessons we can draw from that kind of historic like spike in inflation for what we're experiencing today? Or is it an entirely unique circumstance that we have to just experience anew? So there's that old line from a Greek philosopher that says, can a man stand in the same river twice? No, because it's not the same river and he's not the same man. And that's pretty much how I think about inflations. There are periods that are very odd. The natural state of capitalism, if there is one, isn't inflation, it's deflation because of competition amongst different capitalists. So inflations are just these weird periods when the economy produces rising prices. In my mind, it's usually because of supply shocks, wars, all that sort of stuff, right? So generalizing from these very historically specific things as transcendental lessons, I think is inherently dangerous. We don't live in the world of the 1970s. Some would argue that inflation might have settled down regardless. And Volcker's actions, hiking interest rates, just hastened the process. And by inducing recessions, made it more painful than it needed to be. So we've talked about interest rates. That's the primary tool central banks use to impact inflation. But when that doesn't work, they have this other thing called quantitative easing. You might have heard this jargony word before. It was flying around a lot after the 2008 financial crisis. And again, more recently. It's the big news this week. QE, QE, QE. But what's it all about? Quantitative easing, or QE, is a relatively new idea. Central banks turn to it when inflation is below target. So quantitative easing is meant to combat deflation, which is arguably much worse than inflation, and even to defibrillate an economy out of a recession, at least in theory. QE is an example of expansionary monetary policy. It turns up the heat on the economy by increasing the money supply and injecting liquidity as the central bank buys up assets that are easily convertible to cash. So, you know, it's a fancy name for buying assets and flooding the markets with money in the hope that the people who get the money then buy more assets. That essentially lubricates the economy, encouraging lending and spending. QE was pioneered by the Bank of Japan in the early 2000s to try to shake themselves out of their so-called lost decade, a period of economic stagnation and deflation beginning in the early 1990s. This practice was later adopted by other central banks, including the Fed, in the economic stupor that followed the 2008 financial crisis. But does it work? It's hard to say for sure, but it doesn't have a great track record. It didn't seem to create adequate inflation in Japan in the early 2000s, or elsewhere after the financial crisis. Central banks operate independent of their governments, pursuing and setting their own monetary policy to achieve their goal of steady economic growth and low inflation. But fiscal policy, that's tax and spending policies by a government, they're also an important factor here. Government policies can have a huge impact on some of the causes of inflation. Why don't you do something like, I don't know, um, invest in greening your electricity grid? Why don't you do public investment? Why don't you do loads of other things that would alter your economy? Why is it the only thing that we can do is turn to a central bank and say, please buy and sell assets or please lower the price of money? Governments do take action to fight inflation, but it might be the case that we rely too heavily on monetary policy by central banks and ignore the role of governmental fiscal policy in controlling inflation. And this brings us to today, with inflation yet again on everybody's mind, with causes ranging from disrupted supply chains to the ongoing war in Ukraine, things that the central bank obviously doesn't control. The Fed is raising rates and questions abound about how high inflation will go and how deep an ensuing recession might be if it comes to that. So comparisons with the 70s are inevitable, and it begs the key question here. How much do central banks really control inflation? They're in control of the effects, even if they're not in control of the causes, right? They're not in control of an oil supply shock. They're not in control of Russia's decision to invade Ukraine. They're not in control of the breakdown of global supply chains cause of COVID. But if that leads to sustained price rises, then they have a tool, it's a crude one, called interest rate rises, and they can use that to slow down the economy. So are they in control of it? No, but they can mop up the effects. 
Thanks so much for watching. This has been an interesting and complicated film to produce. There's a lot of moving parts. I learned a lot in the process, and I hope you did too by watching it. If you liked this film, please hit like and subscribe, and stay tuned for more films like this in the future. We release them regularly. So I'll see you next time.